thing as everybody was kind of, oh, got to hit that button. Got it. Right. OK, so we are recording. Um, so first and foremost, let's talk about that. This class is being recorded and this is a whole new skill for a lot of people. So if you don't already know how to crochet, you're going to be wanting to practice this. And this class usually goes up on the um, Michael's YouTube channel within 24 to 48 hours after the end of the class. So you can go back and watch that recording and really slow it down, speed it up, put it on pause, do what you need to do to make the class go at just the right pace for you. I want to cover as much as we can during this hour. So if you start feeling like you're a little bit left behind, just practice the skill you're working on and then you can go back and watch the rest of that class later. Renee from Your Inspirations is here as she's going to be in the chat. And so I'll take breaks every uh, few minutes, every once in a while, and ask her for questions, and she'll help me make sure that we cover your questions as well. Um, I think that's everything I'm supposed to say. I'm not usually the one doing this intro little intro spiel, but I think that covers it. So let's go ahead and get started. As I said, we're going to be working on this hand crocheted throw. Now, I don't want you to worry about the time. Three-hour throw is for somebody who's experienced at this. You're learning a new skill. Like I say, don't Think that you know you need to be able to get it done in three hours or that there's something wrong if you're not getting it done in three hours this is just a big chunky throw that we are crocheting with our hands so without a hook without any needles just our hands and the yarn itself and this is what the blanket that I made looks like when it's done this one was made with about four balls of Bernat blanket big and this blanket is about 36 inches by 36 inches so when we get towards the end of the class I'm going to talk to you about how you can use some of these numbers um, that we'll be getting with the pieces that we'll make today so you can determine how many balls you'll need to make the size of blanket that you want to make because you might want a bigger blanket a bigger lap blanket or maybe something smaller whatever works for you you can adjust it figuring it out from the swatch we're going to make so all that said let me go ahead and set this blanket aside a little bit and i'm going to bring in my hand camera and Chanel, if you could go ahead and switch to the different view, please. Thank you. All right, let's get it turned around. So this is the yarn we are using for this project. It's called Bernat Blanket Big. So if you haven't, if you're not a crocheter or a knitter and this is new to you, you can see this is a really great big thick yarn. Most yarns are not this big and thick. This is a really unusual yarn. You can find it at your local Michaels with all the other yarns, but it's definitely a great big thick yarn and it's this thickness that allows us to hand crochet it if this were a standard yarn which would be a lot thinner let me just literally grab one from the shelf behind me here to show this is sort of your standard weight with this weight of yarn you're going to have a lot harder time hand crocheting you want to have something nice and big and thick like this um if you prefer to use a crochet hook if you are a crocheter already you can use a 20 uh, an s25 which is, I believe, I forget how many millimeters exactly. It's 25 millimeters. It's a US 50. I got the number switched. But that great big hook, probably the biggest one you have in your collection. So you can actually use a crochet hook with this, but it's a really fun one to do with just your hands. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the finished blanket close up here on the screen. I want you to start looking at the stitch anatomy just a little bit. Let me get turned around the right way here. It's a big big thing here to manipulate on my lap so what we have here and if you're already already an experienced crocheter you may recognize these stitches these are just single crochet stitches these are some of the smaller crochet stitches we can make but you can see it's sort of got a basic square shape here so this is a great beginner crochet stitch to make and it's the easiest one to make with our hands but you can do other stitches with your hands if you're a more advanced crocheter as well today we're just going to be sticking to those um, you can see here it is a big thick fabric, but it does have some holes in it and the size of your fingers and your hands and how you use them will determine how thick um, and dense or how loose and gappy your blanket is. So as you begin, you may see some variation. It may not be very even. You may have bigger stitches and looser stitches, and that's OK, because learning to keep the size of your stitches consistent is part of learning how to do this. And it's just something that takes some time. So the first thing we need to do is go ahead and take the label off our yarn and find the end. This yarn, I do recommend you pull from the outside. So I like to just kind of find a strand and give it a tug, usually tucked into the end of the skein there. So we find our end and we're going to go ahead and pull up several, several feet of yarn because each stitch we make with this are, is going to take a lot of yarn. 
So we're going to run through these balls relatively quickly. Although you probably get away with just one ball for tonight. So as we get started here, feel free to crochet along, or you can just go ahead and watch this time and then crochet back with the replay. And of course, drop into the chat where you're tuning in from. So first things first, we want to find that end of our yarn, the end of our skein, and then we're going to come in at good eight to 10 inches or so. You don't have to get out a measuring tape or anything like that. Just eyeball it somewhere between six inches and a foot. We want to come in a good ways because we're going to be making a slip knot and that's going to eat up some of that yarn. And we want to make sure that we have enough of a tail here behind our knot at the end of our knot that it doesn't slip back out and start coming undone. So once we've come in a good, like I say, six, eight, 10 inches or so from the end of our yarn, right about there, what we're going to do is we're going to make our slip knot. So the first thing we do, is just fold the yarn over just like that, okay? Looks a lot like an awareness ribbon, you know, those little magnets that were around the back of everybody's car there for a while. Let's do that again. We've got it out flat. We just make a loop right over, just like that. Then we wanna take this tail end, the tail end of our yarn, and slip it behind that loop we just made. Okay? Then we take our fingers, because we're doing hand crochet here, and we're going to grab that loop. We're gonna reach into that circle and grab that little end of the yarn. And then with our other hand, we can pull those other two ends down a little bit. This is the end that's attached to our skein. This is that tail end. Just give it a little bit of tension here and pull up on that loop. And what that does is that creates our slip knot. And a slip knot is adjustable in size. I could keep pulling on that loop and make it a lot smaller. I could pull up on that loop and make it bigger. With that textured yarn, it takes a little bit of muscle, but you can adjust the size of that loop. Now, that's how everything starts, and I always get lots of requests to see it again, so let's go ahead and do it again. This also lets me show you the other cool thing about crocheting and hand crocheting in general, is if you make a mistake, you can just pull on those ends and it all comes out, all undone. We're just starting over again with our yarn. So let's make that slip knot together one more time before we move on. I'm going to come in, a good 10 inches, 12 inches, whatever makes you comfortable. Pull that tail end over to make a loop, just like that. Okay, then put that tail end right behind that loop, like so. And then you reach right into that loop and we wanna grab that little bit of yarn that's peeking through right there and just pull that right on up and through. And gently, just pull it until you get to a loop that's about this size. And what is this size for me? That's about the right size to fit about three of my fingers into. If you do it with fewer fingers, you'll end up with tighter, denser, smaller stitches. If you do it with more fingers, you'll end up with looser, um, drapier stitches. But for starting out, I recommend starting without a three finger size of loop. Now, obviously, as I mentioned before, and as you all know, everybody's got different hand sizes. So this is just what's comfortable for you. And everybody's blanket is gonna be just a little bit unique because this is a handcrafted item. So don't worry about measuring, don't pull out a, you know, a tape measure or anything out and measure your loops. Just get really comfortable three fingers fit in there it's not too tight you know i'm not trying to squeeze them in there i want them nice and loose i want to be able to wiggle them a little bit but getting a fourth finger in there i mean i could get it in there but i'd have to kind of get a little uncomfortable i want those three fingers to fit in there just really nice and comfortably so once we've got that we've got our slip knot made that's the knot we've got this loop right here on our hand we're ready to start chaining and chaining is the basic building block of everything we're going to do in crochet so when I teach people how to crochet with a hook, a lot of times we'll spend the first hour just working on our chaining. I'm not gonna spend this whole hour chaining because again, I wanna be able to show you all these techniques and this is a video, you'll be able to go back and watch. But for tonight, if you've gotten this far and you wanna practice, um, and this is a very new skill for you, I would absolutely re recommend just practicing your chaining tonight and then coming back to the video for the rest of the skills, just because once you get this rhythm down, it's going to make everything else so much easier. So we've got this loop on our hand. We've got it on these three fingers. I'm right-handed, so I like to use my right hand for this. Now I'm going to take 
This is the end of the yarn that's still attached to the skein, and I want to do what's called a yarn over. This is the same thing you do with a hook. We're doing it now with our hands. We want to take our yarn behind our fingers and put it up over those fingers. So let's do that again. I have this slip knot on my fingers, and now I want to yarn over with our yarn. This is the end of the yarn that's attached to our skein right there. And I want to do a yarn over. So I want to bring that yarn behind my fingers and up over my fingers. What you don't want to do is pull that yarn up in front of your fingers. We want to do it the same way every time for every stitch. We want to go behind the fingers, up over the top. Then what we can do is we want to use the ends of these fingers. And there's lots of different ways that you can do this. There's no right or wrong way. It's whatever's comfortable for your hand. You can sort of scoop them like this if you want to. You can pinch it a little bit like this if you want to. But you want to take this loop of yarn that we've just put over our fingers and pull it up through that first loop we made with the slip knot. Until now, this new loop is the same size as our three fingers again. Don't worry, I'm going to do that again. And if you didn't like the ways yours turned out, just give it a little pull. And now we're right back down to our slip knot. So we'll put the slip knot on our fingers. Then we're going to yarn over. We bring the yarn behind our fingers, up over the top. And then we can use our other hand. Again, whatever is comfortable for you, pinch it and pull it through and bring that loop up through the slip knot loop. And now that loop is our new loop on our fingers. And we've made what we call one chain. This is one chain right there. So let's take a quick look at that chain. If we look at our chain, this is the top of the chain and it looks a little bit like a V. This one, because it's our first one, ends right in that slip knot. If we turn it over and look at the back or underneath of that chain, you can see here are those two pieces that made the V on top. And there's a hump right there in the middle. If we see it from the side, you can see it kind of sticks up. So this is the top of our chain. It looks like a V. And this is underneath our chain. And it's got a little hump right there in the middle. And then this loop right here is our active loop. And that's the one we just took our fingers out of. And now we want to put our fingers back into. Now, anytime we put our fingers, take our fingers out of that uh, loop and then put them back in, we want to make sure that we don't end up twisting that loop. If you get that loop twisted up either direction, it's going to start causing some twisting in your chain and it's just going to make it really confusing and difficult to work into. So if you've taken your fingers out and you want to make sure that you've got them back in that loop the right way, we put them from the side with the V, put them in the loop. And then when I pull on the yarn that's attached to our skein, the part of the loop that moves should be in front of my fingers. You guys see that as I pull back on that, this is the part that was moving down into that stitch. So that tells me right now that that loop is facing the correct direction. Now we're 15 minutes in. I'm not sure if Renee is back. She had to step away for just a second, which is why I was kind of doing that intro. Um, oh, it looks like we're she here. is back. We're Yay! good. So Thank you so much. I thought it was much. a good time to uh, stop and ask if there were any questions. Sorry, y'all. We had a delivery driver come visit me at <laughs> a very inopportune time. Um, good so far. Everyone's just processing. Okay, great. So we've got. We've made our first chain. We've got a loop on our hook. This doesn't count as a chain. This is our active loop. It's not counted as a chain. The one on the hand never is. But now we're ready to make another one. So let's do that again. We're going to take the end of the yarn that's attached to our skein and go up over from the back. We want to yarn over our hand from behind. So just pull that yarn right behind your hand and up over those fingers. Then grab that yarn and pull that loop on, up, and through. Make sure that portion of the yarn that you're pulling on is in front of you, that it's facing you, and that'll keep that loop from getting twisted as well. Then you can adjust that loop as needed. Pull back down on it if you need to, pull up on it as you need to, to make sure it's comfortable for your three fingers. But now we've made two chains. And if we come back and look, we've got the first V there that goes down into that slip knot. Right there. Let me get that a little straightened out a little better. Here we go. This is that first V. It goes down to that slip knot. Here's that second V, and you can see it's nested 
comes right into the center of the first V we made. And coming out of that is our active loop. On the back, we now have two of those humps, one and two. So we've made two chains. Again, we only count the ones we've made, not the one we're actually working with. So we get our fingers right back in there and we chain some more. Go up over your hand and pull that loop through. We want to take our time and make sure that these loops that we pull up with our hand are nice and generous, that they're not super tight. If these loops get too small, it'll be really hard to work back into these chains to start crocheting the body of our blanket. We need to make sure that we've got a little bit of wiggle room there. So let's do just a couple more of these together before we move on to our single crochets. We're going to take our yarn, come up over our hand, and pull that loop through that first loop that was on our fingers. Now we've got a new loop and do it again. Yarn over and pull that loop up and through. Let's do one more. Yarn over and pull that loop up and through. Now let's look and see what we've made. We have, if we count those little V's, and sometimes if they want to get a little strange or twisted, you give them a little tug that helps them straighten out. Got one, two, three, four, five, and six. There we are. So we have made six chains now. Now, if you wanted to make a 36 inch blanket, you would need to start with 17 chains. If you wanted a different width of blanket, you'd want to start with a different width of chains. And we'll talk about the specifics for the numbers, like I say, as we get closer to the end of the class. For now, I just want to work on this little swatch. It's easier to keep on camera and it will be able to get through simply more steps this way. So for now, I'm just going to make this little guy. But after we've made however many chains you want to make for the width of your blanket, this is what determines the width of your blanket or project, seat pad, cushion, pillow, whatever you're making. We're going to chain across for the width. Then we're going to start making rows of single crochet that will give us the length. And we'll be making however many rows we want to make for the length of the blanket. Again, it's your project. It's up to you. So we've got our chains here. And there's something interesting about the very last chain we made. It's just like all the other chains we've made. Not this one. This is our active loop. But this chain is just like all the others. But we're going to treat it a little differently. This last chain that we made is going to act as what we call the turning chain. And the turning chain is what we use as a little ladder. It basically creates a little ladder, a little platform, so that when we go back and work into these chains, we're going to be working back across the chains we made. And then for our next row, we'll work back across those stitches and on across our work. But as we work back across these, we want to have a little ladder so that all our stitches are a nice uh, height. If we didn't have our turning chain here, then it would squish our first stitch. So the way the turning chain works is essentially we skip right over it. When we go to work back into the rest of those chains, we're going to skip the chain that's closest to our active loop, closest to our hand, because it's our ladder. We don't want to work back into this particular chain. So when you are crocheting or hand crocheting the width of your blanket, you need to add one more chain to act as that ladder because the blanket itself then would only be as wide as those five stitches. Because that just happens to be how many I've made here for our little swatch. So now let me pull that loop deck down. I don't want it to be too big. I only want it to be those few fingers. We're going to skip over that chain was closest to the hook. And then we're going to single crochet into each remaining chain across until we get back down to that very first chain we made. Now there's lots of different ways that we could work into this chain and I'm going to show you my favorite way to do it right now. There's lots of reasons and some of them are very technical so I'm not going to get it onto all of them right now but working into the portion of the chain I'm about to show you gives you a better finished edge for your finished project. So where do I want you to work? I want you to go ahead and flip that chain over. It's those back humps that I was showing you before. And you can see now that we've made a few more, how those line up through the center there really nicely. And if I turn them to the side, get my hand out of the way there a little bit, you can kind of see how they stick up there. They always remind me a little bit of Loch Ness humps. I always say that they remind me of the Loch Ness monster, those little humps coming out of the water in the classic photos. Those loops right there, that straight stitch that going right back through the middle on the back of those chains, 
Those are the loops we're looking for as we start crocheting row one. So let's put our hand right back in our stitch here, get it nice and adjusted. We're going to skip over the one that was closest to our hand. So that would be the back hump for the one that's closest to our hand. We want to skip that one altogether. It's just our ladder. Come to the next one. Look for the one right in the middle and find that loop right there. Okay, I'm going to pull that back a little bit more so we can take our time. I've got my chain, or excuse me, my active loop on my hand. This is that back hump for the chain that's closest to my hand. And this is the next one right there. Now, if you're crocheting along with me right now and you're having a lot of trouble dist distinguishing these loops from each other, try and just pick the same one from each chain to work into. But it's just a practice swatch so you can continue and move on and uh, come back and master that a little bit later if desired. So what are we gonna do? We've got our loop on our hook. We found the loop we want to. This is our destination. Without taking this loop off our hand, we're going to go ahead and insert our hand right under that loop as well. Just like that. And we want to do that going away from us. Don't come into that loop towards yourself. You want to do that going away from yourself right there. So now I have that active loop that's attached to our skein that was already on my fingers. And I've stuck my fingers right under the loop of that chain that we made before. Now what I want to do with those two loops on my hook, and you can go ahead and shove them right back to your knuckles there as needed. We're gonna take the end of our yarn that's attached to our skein and we're going to yarn over again. So it looks a little funny because we're kind of right there. There's not a lot of, you know, up and over, but we just wanna make sure we come from the back up over the top of our fingers. Then we're going to pull this loop right here through both of these loops. So again, you can use both your hands, pinch them together, whatever makes it easy for you, and just pull that loop right on up through both of those loops. Like so. There we are. And that is our first single crochet. Now, don't worry, I'm going to pull that all out and do it again. So if you don't like the way yours is working out either, you can always just give a tug on that yarn end that's attached to the skein and your stitches will come right out. So let's do it again. I'm going to insert my hook, my hook. I keep trying to say my hook because that's what I'm used to. I'm going to insert my hand into that active loop. I'm going to make sure that the portion of the yarn that moves when I pull on the end attached to the skein is in front of my fingers so I know it's facing the right direction. I want to lay my chains out really nicely and find that center back hump for each of those chains. Find the first one in the stitch closest to my hand and skip over it. Go to the next one and insert my fingers right under that loop of the chain until both of those loops are on my hand. See, that's our end of our yarn there. It's just hanging out. It's not doing anything right now. So now with both of those loops on my hand, I take that yarn end, bring it up over my fingers again, grab it and pull it through both of those loops. Pull that loop up to your three finger size or whatever you're doing that feels comfortable. And we've made our first stitch. So to continue, we come back to that chain. We don't have to worry about any more turning chains. We just need one at the beginning of the row. So we find the very next center of that very next stitch there, that back hump. Insert our fingers right under that stitch. So now we've got that active loop. We've got our fingers under the loop from the chain. We bring our working yarn up over our fingers and you can see it's getting a little tight so if you need to push it around a little bit make some room yarn over grab that yarn and pull it through all of those loops both of those loops that were on your hand until you've got another three finger loop made so now we can stop here and take a quick break and look at our first two single crochets so we want to look at the stitch anatomy of these stitches a little bit because it makes it easier to work back into them as we go so here is our first single crochet. This right here is that turning chain it's hanging out there on the end. This right here is the top of our first single crochet. And remember when we looked at the top of those chains, we had those V's. Now we've got V's at the top of our stitches. We've made two single crochets. So we've got one right there and then nested right into it is another one right there. So that's what the tops of those stitches are going to look like. So now what we need to do is continue making single crochets across the rest of our chain. So I'm gonna take a quick sip of my water and Renee, are there any questions I can answer here before I continue across row one? No, it's still pretty quiet. I think everyone's just enjoying the experience. 
Excellent. <laughs> Possibly listening to my dogs bark at my delivery drivers. <laughs> I can hear them upstairs going crazy. It's that time of year. All right. So let's continue on across. We want to just take our time. You know, if things get, if you have to put it down, come back to it. Sometimes things get a little ruffled up. So just go ahead and take your time. Find that stitch. Make sure it's on your fingers the way you like. Lay out the rest of your row. Find that next middle hump there. Slide your fingers right on in. Go ahead and push those back to the knuckle as necessary. Yarn over and pull that loop up and through. And then make that loop a three, a three finger loop. Lay it out. We've got just a couple more to go. Find the next one. Insert your fingers right under that loop. Give them a little wiggle if it feels a little tight. Yarn over and pull that loop up and through. Now, a really common question I get is working back into these chains, a lot of people find that the chain is too small, that they can't get their fingers under that loop, or they can't get their hook under that loop for that matter when they're working with a hook. And what that means is that those, that was, those chains you made at the very beginning were just too tight. You might wanna add another finger, you might wanna give a little wiggle before you pull through the next one. And another thing to watch for is that as you yarn over and pull that yarn through, that you're not pulling back on it as you finish the stitch because that will tighten up those chains and make it difficult to get back into. So there's my little tip for that if that's something you encounter as you crochet. So we've worked our way across here. We've got one more chain left. You can see this is our slip knot right here. So there's that back hump coming right up out of that slip knot. So for the very last stitch, it's just like all the rest. We insert our fingers right under that loop, yarn over and pull it on up through those two loops. There we are. So now I like to give it a little, a little zhuzh here, straighten it out nicely. That is our first row of single crochet. Doesn't look like much, but we're going to build up from here. And from here on out, we don't work into those chains anymore. Those chains have all been used up. We're going to be working into the stitches of the previous row. So if we come back and look at the top of that row we just made again, now we've got those V's on top here. When we crochet under these, we're going to be going under both of those loops. Rather than into the back hump of a chain, we'll now be going under both of those loops at the top of our single crochet. So let's go ahead and turn over here and look at it from this side. When you look at the single crochet from the side and you pull up those two loops a little bit, you can see a little bit of daylight right there. That little hole right there, that is what we're looking for when we're looking at them from the side. So let's go ahead and come back here and start row two together. Now, this end here, this is our tail end at the end of our slip knot. At the end of the class, I will show you how to secure that. Um, but for now, just go ahead and leave that hanging out right there. So let's get our hand back here in our turn, well, in our loop, I should say, our active loop. Make sure it's facing the right direction there. And now, as we begin row two, we need to make a turning chain. When we started our initial chain, you'll remember that last chain was our turning chain. We don't have a bunch of chains anymore. Now we've got stitches, so we have to make our turning chain to begin. So this chain, the way to make it is just like all the other chains. We've got our uh, loop on our hand. We yarn over with our yarn and pull that loop just right on through. And there, just as before, now we've got one chain. We've got our little ladder that starts our second row. So after you've pulled that loop up and through, we need to turn our work. So the main thing about turning your work is to be consistent. And especially if you're right-handed, I recommend that you turn it just like you were turning the book, the page of a book. So just turn it right on over, just like we're reading a book. Flip it on over, and now we're ready to work back across those stitches. So when you're if you're having a trouble with your stitches being too loose um, or too tight, honestly, that's kind of what I talk about when I say um, practicing your chaining and why with a hook we would, if we were in person, we'd spend probably, you know, the first hour just working on that chaining because maintaining the size of those stitches and those loops, getting them the size that's comfortable for you, um, making those chains big enough to work into is genuinely the very first challenge most crocheters, whether by hand or by hook, it is the first challenge and it just comes with practice. Um, I wish I had some shortcuts for that one. I think if I would, I'd have made my millions, but alas, 
uh, that is just part of the practice for this particular craft. So I've got my turning chain right there. See right there, that's the chain I just made. And I've got the five stitches that I made in my previous row. So I don't want to work into that chaining or that turning chain. I want to find the top of that first single crochet that I made. So here, right here, we can see it's really dark right there, that little cave that if we put our fingers, we've got the active loop still on our fingers there, but now we want to put our fingers right in that little cave. And it should take us right under the top two loops of that stitch. So let's do that again. I've got the active loop on my hand. I've made my turning chain right there. I come back and look at my work, lay it out nice and flat. I've turned it over to work back the other direction. Find that first little dark spot right there and you can check and see, does that go under those two loops at the top? Yep, it's the right spot. So we put our hand right in there, those same three fingers. So now we've got the loop that was on our hand to begin with, our active loop. We have the two loops at the top of that first stitch and our fingers are under all three of those. Now we need to do the same thing. We yarn over, pull it from the back over the tops of our fingers and pull that loop now through all these loops. So this can be a little awkward and that's okay. Get your other thumb in there if you need to, to pull it out. You know, like I say, hook it between your fingers, whatever works for you. Everybody is going to do that part just a little bit differently. It's whatever is comfortable for your hand. As long as you are getting loops you like, and that can take some practice, then you're doing it okay. So that one got a little crazy. I didn't like how loose that one got because I was chatting so much while making it. So I went ahead and pulled it back out. So now I want to pull down, make sure this is the part that moves. There's my turning chain. There's my first stitch. Insert my hand under both of those loops. Yarn over with my yarn. Pull that yarn through all those loops that had been on my hand. Pull that loop through till it's a three finger loop. And now I've got my first single crochet for row two. So let's look at our work. We want to come over now and find that next little cave. That's where we want to put our next stitch. We can double check and make sure. If we go through there, does it get us under those top two loops of the next stitch? Yes, it does. So we insert our hand right there. Go ahead and this can, these can start getting a little tight and that's okay. We just wanna get our hand in there as best we can. The main thing is to maintain the size of this loop. The size of these loops are already set because this stitch is finished. This stitch, we're making right now. This loop is still active. So if this one's a little tight, don't worry too much about it. If you need to only get two fingers in there or you know, do bring it over and then pinch it to pull it through like that. Again, whatever works for you. Then pull it up through all those loops and just make sure that loop, each time that you pull it up, that you get it nice and big and at least a good three fingers here wide to start. So now we've made two single crochets in our second row. And it can look a little bit like a jumbled mess if you're not used to looking at your crochet stitches, that's okay. Right now we are just learning this and as you go, the stitches will become more and more consistent. And as you make these stitches, really pay attention to where each of these loops lands as you make them. And that will help you read your crochet a little bit better. These are some big skills that we're learning today um, and a really different way of using our hands. So I've got three more to go here for row two. I've got my active loop here on my fingers. So I lay out my work. This is what my stitch is coming out of right now. You can see this is where we're attached. This is where I just put a stitch. So I wanna come over to the next one. Look for that little dark spot. Send this right on those two loops at the top right there. Insert our fingers right in there. Go ahead and wiggle them in there if you need to. Bring our yarn up over the top of our fingers. And then just pull that loop on up and through. Pull it up nice and high again. Got just two more it looks like here at the end of our row. So we go to the next one. Yarn over, pull it through. Pull it up nice and high. Finally got to the end of my skein, all the yarn I'd pulled out at the beginning of class. Let me pull off some more of my skein here. Like I said, you do run through this um, pretty fast. So it's a good idea to pull up a yard or two and get them loose. Um, you know, when you get a chance, because you don't want, you don't want a lot of tension. You don't want the yarn that's coming off the skein to be really tight because that's what's going to make these loops really tight and make these stitches really difficult to work back into. 
So when we come to the end of our row here, you can see this is our last stitch, our last little cave that we can go into here. So we can yarn over and just pull through those three loops. And with that, we will have finished row two. So on our little swatch here, I've just been making five stitches. So it's very easy for me, especially with my you know experienced crocheting to look at this and say at the end of each row, okay, I've got five stitches, I'm in good shape. I'm not losing stitches, I'm not skipping stitches, I'm not adding a stitch in a turning chain that doesn't belong there. I'm working evenly. However, if you are new to crochet, that can be really tricky. I remember it took me a long, long time, honestly, to learn how to read my stitches really well. So in that case, what I recommend you get are these little guys here called stitch markers. And it's okay if you don't have these around tonight, especially um, if you've got a safety pin, or a paper clip can work just as well in a pinch. Um, but basically, it's usually a little plastic safety pin looking guy like this. They come in lots of great colors. And you can use these to mark your stitches. And this is how I would use these for this pattern. Right here, let me get this all sort of straightened out here, is the top of that very first single crochet I made in row two. You can take your stitch marker and it's it is difficult it's easier with uh more standard size yarns with the jumbo yarn it is you know a little bit more difficult and you can use it to mark one of those strands or both of those strands it's really puffy but it does squish down quite a bit and then you can just close that stitch marker and then you'll know as you go back and forth this is the last uh stitch on this side and then we can do the same thing on this side let me pull that loop up a little bit there so I don't lose my stitch right there. We find those last two loops at the top of that last stitch we made on that row. We put it right in that stitch marker. There we go. And now when we do our turning chain and the same thing, just like we did for row two for the rest of the blanket, we're gonna do a turning chain, turn it over and single crochet back across working into those tops of those previous stitches. With the stitch marker there, you'll always know this is the first one I work into and then the last one. And then you can turn it and say, okay, now this is the new first one and that's the last one. And that will just help you maintain um, those even edges. So whether it's this project or another crochet project, um, if you decide to learn how to crochet with a hook, using a stitch marker in the first and last stitch of every row will really help you keep those sides even. Um, and in addition to that, especially as you're beginning, you do wanna try and take the time and count your stitches if you can. Um, just to help you maintain your stitch count. You guys are so quiet today. I'm having to take a little breaks for my, <laughs> to taste up my water. Um, okay, so that is row two. So let's go ahead and make a few stitches of row three. And then I want to talk about how to finish your blanket when you are all done, how to add more yarns, and how to figure out to make um, your blanket or your project the size that you want it to be. So I've put this down. I've been turning it all over. How do I figure out how to get my hand back in here? Well, I'm going to take the end of my yarn that's attached to my skein. I'm going to give it a real gentle tug. I don't want to undo my work. I like this loop, but I know it's a little big and I need to see which direction it's facing. So as I pull on it, I can see this is the portion that's going back into that stitch. So I know that's the portion that goes right in front of my fingers. So now I can give it a real good tug and get it right back down to three finger size. And then we need to do our turn. And remember, we want to do it the same direction every time. So we just turn the page of our book and then we are ready to work back across for row three. And like I say, rows three, four, five, six, however many rows you want to make for the size of your project are all going to be exactly the same as what we were doing in row two. So we get our working yarn here sort of behind our work. So it's out of the way a little bit here. And then we need to make our turning chain. So. We yarn over and pull that loop up and through. Now, last time I made the turning chain, I did it before I turned our work over. This time I did it afterwards. Doesn't matter when you do it, before or after the turn. Again, personal preference. But we wanna make sure that we get that little ladder made so then our stitches can all be nice and even and proud and high here. So we've got our stitch marker right there. So we know this is that first stitch that we wanna work into for this row. So I can go ahead and put my hand right under those two loops. Then I want to go ahead and get my stitch marker out of the way. If you need to do that beforehand, you can do that beforehand, whatever works for you. 
get your hand right in that stitch again we've got our active loop now we've got the two loops that were at the top of that first stitch we want to bring our yarn up over the top of our fingers and then grab it however works for your hands and pull that loop up and through the stitch and now we can mark our new first stitch of the row we can look back and see our active loop is coming out of the center of this little v right here so we know that v those two loops are the top of our first stitch so we can get our stitch marker right back around there and now that'll be ready and waiting for us and then we just continue on exactly as we've been doing before we've got our loop on our hook lay out our work look for that next little cave we just want to go straight across from where we are make sure that takes us under both of those loops because sometimes that one can fall behind a little bit you want to make sure you get both those loops at the top of the stitch insert your hand yarn over pull that loop through all those loops and pull your loop up nice and high and then just continue crocheting across but for the sake of demonstration oh no we have run out of yarn this skein must might have been an odd end who knows for whatever reason i was using up some stuff we're going to pretend that i've run out of yarn on this skein what do i do when i want to add a second skein of yarn because for most projects you're going to be using more than one skein of yarn so we're going to go ahead and cut it right now and pretend pretend that this was the end of the skein i've now run out of yarn and i want to add a new one now this is a technique that is specific to this yarn this is not a technique that i recommend um, for those standard yarns like the smaller yarn that i showed you earlier or the yarns that are twisted or plied this is going to be specific to this yarn in particular um, i mentioned before this is bernat blanket big it's what's called a chenille style yarn so if you're not a crocheter or a knitter you may not be familiar with it but you can see how it's really fuzzy and what's it's kind of hard to see it's easier to feel which unfortunately doesn't translate well for camera but there's just a little core of sewn thread you know it's really strong and it holds everything together but that goes right through the middle that's what gives it its squish and lets it fit down inside that switch uh, stitch marker but it makes weaving in ends the traditional way a little bit um, a little bit more difficult it's really puffy um, if you make a knot in it the knot itself turns out really big so we want to use a slightly different method than we do with other yarns so it does take a little extra supplies here and this right here this is an extraneous supply this is just something i use as a needle threader um, the important part is that you want an actual sewing needle difficult to show but hopefully you're familiar with them a little bit here and then you'll want some matching thread it doesn't need to be an exact match you can he see here this is quite a bit of darker gray it's mostly going to be hidden but just in case a little bit of that thread peeps through it's a great idea to match it as closely as you can here so i've got my coats and clark thread i'm just going to go ahead and get it on my needle um you know however you like to get your needle threaded there are lots of different tools out there this just happens to be the one i use makes it a little bit quicker so you don't have to watch me try and thread a needle for 15 minutes during class at least it does when it works let's see here today it doesn't want to work for me hmm. there it goes i felt it going okay get your needle threaded again whatever method you need to use to get your needle threaded works and then we're going to go ahead and cut our thread we don't want to leave it attached to our bobbin and then we take our thread ends which is a big change after handling that big yarn my hands aren't quite ready for the change there we go i want to take those thread ends and just tie a good knot just as if you were sewing on a button or doing a little bit of mending around the house we want to put a good knot here i like to do a couple of them right on top of each other just to secure the ends of that thread really well let's do one more just to give us a really good end and this technique like i say this is what i do for this yarn when i want to add a new skein of it um, when i want to keep going with a project and it's also how i handle the ends when i'm all done and i'm ready to quote unquote weave in my ends this is how i do these instead so i think if i can get it to focus pretty well there i've got a tiny little knot and i've just trimmed it off a little bit close to the knot not too close but i didn't want giant long ends out there and then what we're going to do is take the ends of our yarn we can clean them up a little bit because they've got those fuzzies so if you cut the fuzzies they're going to want to fuzz up on you so we'll pull those out of the way 
And then we just take the ends of our yarn and we're simply going to layer one right on top of the other. You don't have to get too fancy with it, about an inch or so. Again, don't have to measure, just eyeball it until there's, they're good and overlapped. You don't want to end up just sewing through the end because it is all fuzzy. You want to make sure that you get down here to the core on both of these pieces. And then simply send your needle right through the center of both of those bits of yarn. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that on through. And you can see it really just disappears right into the fuzziness. If I'd used a contrasting color, it might have been a little better for seeing the demo, but I wanted to show you how well it does disappear. Even though it is a little bit of darker gray, you can see it just disappears right in there. So you'll want to take several of these stitches and I just go back and forth. I don't do anything too fancy. There's not a particular stitch. Um, I'm not going around. I'm just going, when I come out on this side, I'll go back in on this side and I just pick a place nearby. Nothing, nothing too fancy. I'm not, you know, doing any particular design or anything. I just want to go back and forth a few times until it feels like it's really, really well connected. So before I tie that off, I'll go ahead and give it a tug and make sure. Yeah, that's not going anywhere at all. So then I can simply go back here to my thread and tie it off and trim it off securely. So this is how I would go ahead and add a new skein and we can take a few stitches with this here so you can see how that works. Of course, now my knot wants to be all messy on me. I tell you, tying off threads for me is where the threads always want to rebel. There we go. They want me to pay attention. Okay, so once we've got those tied on, there we go. Now we can go ahead and trim our thread off. All right. And our yarn ends are really nice and secure. And you can give a little extra trim to the ends of these if you like. But with this fuzzy yarn, that's really going to be pretty well hidden. So for this scenario, we've attached new yarn. If when it comes time to weave in and close up our ends, here you can see this is the beginning tail of our blanket. Rather than just sewing it straight down, I would go ahead and take my hands and just weave it under some of the other stitches around it. Grab a stitch, just get it right in there. We want to pull it into the body of the blanket just a little bit. And of course, you know, wait till the end, you'll have a lot more stitches to pull it into here. But we just sort of weave it back and forth through some of these stitches until we get to a point where it's a few inches into the blanket. And then we would do the same thing. We would get that yarn needle, tie the uh, knot in the end of our yarn, and just sew right back and forth. Sew through that tail end a few inches in, and then through one of the stitches of your blanket. Like I say, those stitches are going to get hidden really well, especially once you trim that off. And then once that's sewn down, then you can take your scissors and trim off that excess yarn so that you've just got the part that's sewn down. But I have, from what I have uh, experienced with this yarn, that is absolutely the best way to secure those ends. So let's take a couple more stitches with this yarn. I just want to show you how it works up here before we get to the math to finish it up with. So I've got that loop on my hand here. We just find that very next stitch, insert our hand right in there, yarn over with our yarn, just ignore that knot like it's one continuous strand of yarn. Pull that loop oop, up and through both of those loops. There we go. And there it is. Oh, it's still right there. So we haven't quite hit it yet. Let's do it in the next stitch. Go right in there. Make sure we yarn over. You can see our knots right there, but it's just going to disappear right into our fabric there. So it's just right in there. Even if it ended up on this loop, it would probably get hidden by the next stitch that I would take in the next row. So then you just come on down. You can see here's our mark, our stitch marker, which wants to get in the way of my fingers. So I'll go ahead and take it out. I know it's the last stitch of the row though. I can simply go in there, yarn over again, and pull through. And we have finished row three. And our connected yarn, our sewn together yarn, somewhere buried inside that stitch. Very nice and secure. So when you get to the end of your blanket and you've made all the rows you want to make, you've got that last active loop on the hook. What are you going to do with it? We're going to go ahead and cut our yarn again. We want to leave a good few inches to work with. And then we just take that final end and pull it right through that final loop. Give it a good tug. And now that yarn end is secure. So now we take that yarn end and do the same thing. Weave it into those stitches that we've made before until it's a few inches into the blanket. And then use that needle and thread to sew it right back down. And then that end will be nice and secure. 
And sewing it is going to be your best option, especially if it's a project like a blanket that you want to throw into the washer and dryer. So with all that made, now let's try and in the last nine minutes here, I want to give you guys the basics of the math for this stuff. Here we have, let me get it straightened out again here. Here we have my finished blanket that I made 36 inches by 36 inches. I used four skeins of yarn to do this. And when I measured out, I can take a tape measure at this point and measure out the sizes of those stitches and the sizes of the rows. So if we look at the anatomy of the stitch, you can see these little bits right here coming down into the stitch below. This was that cave. This is the bottom of that stitch. Here's the front of that V. And now that stitch was worked down into that cave. So it gives you a little bit of an idea as you learn to read your stitches. You can see, you can measure out your, the height of your rows like this. Alternatively, you can take the swatch you've made and see, you know, if I know I've made three rows, how tall is that swatch? That gives me some measurements. Then we can take the measurements from the swatch we've made, because again, this is where everybody's is going to be different because everybody has different sized hands. So everybody's swatch is going to end up being a slightly different size. And now we can talk a little bit about that math. Now, these numbers are all using the numbers that I got using my hands. So your numbers may be different, um, but these are the numbers that I found worked for me. So over here is where we actually want to start. I got a 36 inch wide blanket with 16 stitches. I did this by chaining 17, skipping the chain closest to the hook, and crocheting 16 single crochets across. So I've got a little proportional um, ah, fraction. That's the word I was looking for, a little fraction here. 36 inches, 16 stitches. But let's say I wanted to make a 50 inch blanket, you know, a little bit more elapsed size, something to cuddle up with this winter. So I can put that number over here in the same place on top, 36 inches, 50 inches, we want that on top. And then we can solve I know a little bit of math flashbacks here for people. We want to solve for this little box right here. So if you'll remember your math to do that, we multiply 16 times 50 and then divide by 36. Now those actual numbers, of course, depend on the numbers you've plugged in here. So they could be any numbers at all, but this is the formula. Multiply the two that are there, the two that we have available to us, and divide by that one to get this one right here. So. Let's go ahead and I had to write out that math because uh, my calculator is busy being my camera right now. 60 times 15 is 800 divided by 36 equals 22.22. So we have a decision to make. We can't make 22.22 stitches. I, at least I don't know how to. I haven't learned how to do that. Sounds quite fancy. So we have to decide, are we going to do 22 stitches or are we going to do 23 stitches? Or, you know, do we want to do even more if we want to go wider? But we know that's our goal, our target there. So we have to choose, choose either 22 or 23. For something like a blanket, I always like it a little bit big, uh, a little bit bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and go with 23 stitches. I want a little bit bigger blanket. Now to make those 23 stitches, though, remember you're need to, going to need to make 24 stitches chains we need to chain one more because that very last chain is going to be the turning chain at the end so that is the basic like i say your numbers may be very different you need to make your swatch and see how many stitches you need to get the width of blanket that you want it to be this could be any number it could be five it could be 500 but the math the basic math there is the same so I've got some got some math already pre-done here, and I just want to make sure um, that I am doing this in the right order here, because I, I teach crochet, but I don't usually teach math except for this class, so please bear with me here. So we've got our 36 inch by 36 inch blanket. For me, that took four balls of yarn. Again, your mileage may vary. You've got your own hands. But we want to figure out using that if you've made your swatch and you've made maybe a 12 inch by 12 inch square for example and it took one ball that's a good still a good start that lets you know approximately how much area you can get with a ball of yarn so 36 times 36 gives us 1296 36 
inches wide by 36 inches long means that 1,296, that is our area. We multiply the length and the width to get the square inches for our blanket. Now I know I did that with four balls, so I divide that by four, and I know that I'm going to get approximately 324 square inches per ball of yarn used. So if I want to make a 50 inch by 50 inch blanket, if you'll remember, we came back here and figured out to make our 50 inch blanket, we're going to need to start with 24 chains, 23 stitches, but how much yarn are we gonna need? Now we can figure out 50 times 50, gives us 2,500 square inches, and we get 324 square inches per ball of yarn. So 2,500 square inches divided by 324 square inches per ball tells us we need 7.7 .7 balls of yarn. And again, kind of like stitches, balls come in whole, so when you go to the store, you'll want to make sure to buy eight balls of yarn. If there's ever a question, if this had been 7.1 and you were saying, oh gosh, maybe I can squeeze it out, I always recommend that you go ahead and buy one extra ball if there's any doubt, because there's nothing worse than getting down to that last row with just a few stitches left to take and you just don't have quite enough yarn. So I know that was a lot of math. Like I say, math teaching is not my, uh, my first skill, so hopefully that made sense. Um, but basically it is, your standard sort of proportional fractions here. We do some cross multiplication to figure out how many stitches you need for the blanket you want to have. And then you can use your swatch information from your practice swatch and see how much of yarn that used to help you determine how much yarn you'll need to buy to make the full size of the blanket you like. And then wrap it up here with one more look at the finished stitches there, so you get an idea of what those look like. So Renee, were there any last questions here I could ta tackle in those last couple minutes? No, no more math questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> yep, all good. I think you did okay. a really thorough job explaining. Thank you for walking us through all of that. Of course, great. Um, we can go ahead and come back to the other camera if you'd like. Um, thank you all so much for joining me. I think this is my, gonna be my last Michaels class for 2021, unless I end up jumping in on another one here at the end of the year. So I just want to thank you all so much for joining me tonight. It's been a lot of fun um, teaching you these things over the year, and I hope you'll join me for my next one. And of course, all the other great classes on Michaels as well. So I just want to say happy holidays from me, and I'll go ahead and turn it on over to Renee. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us for this live community classroom with Michaels, or live math classroom with Michaels. <laughs> Don't way. forget to share your work with hashtag make it with Michaels and hashtag Yarnspo. That's Y-A-R-N-S-P-O. And just a reminder that you can find more classes on michaels.com and a recording of today's class at michaels.com slash classes. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.